If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. We know the tales of Hyrule's birth, of the goddesses Din, Nehru, and Feror, of the Triforce in the Sacred Realm. We walked beside an old hero as he saved the lands of Hyrule and Termina. We met a princess, a powerful being who graced and guided the hero with her wisdom. Together, they succeeded, through pain and loneliness, so that others might be spared the torment of an evil king, each of them an aspect of the legendary Triforce. When the hero of old vanquished Ganon in his adult years, the Princess Zelda sought to undo some of his pain. He had lost seven years of his life to this journey, denied a significant portion of his life, so she sent the hero back, fracturing the possibilities of what Hyrule would become. In her timeline, countless generations later, the world would be flooded and the legend of the Hero of Time would be kept close in the hearts of this world's inhabitants. Perhaps stories that will walk together another day. But for the land of Hyrule, in the timeline that we remain in, where Link was returned to his childhood to walk the lands of Termina, there's a far different tale to tell. The courageous hero and the wise princess went on to have families, descendants, bloodlines that carried on through the ages. But what of Ganondorf? When Link was returned to his childhood after the evil king was defeated, the boy rushed to Hyrule Castle where he told the young Princess Zelda all about what was to come. Zelda was finally able to convince her father of the Gerudo King's evil intentions and Ganondorf was arrested. He was imprisoned before he could cause any harm, and there he stayed for many, many years. The promise of execution lingered nearby. His days were numbered. Ganondorf was taken back to his homeland eventually, in the Gerudo Desert, to a terrible place called the Arbiter's Grounds. This bloodied prison served as a holding place for Hyrule's most terrible criminals and the execution grounds where their lives would be ended. When Ganondorf's time finally came, it was the sages themselves who would oversee the Gerudo King's sentence. Without mercy, because he was unworthy of it, he was bound to a massive stone, and a sword was driven through his body by the Sage of the Water Temple. Ganondorf was supposed to die that day. But through divine intervention, his life was preserved, for destiny does not take sides. Ganondorf was spared a violent death. An aspect of the Triforce awoke within him, the aspect of power that was by all rights his to possess, and Ganondorf broke free from his chains. He killed the Sage of the Water Temple with his bare hand to the horror of the remaining five. He pulled his execution weapon from his own chest and turned his eyes upon them. In desperation, the five sages turned their eyes to an ancient artifact on the execution grounds, the Mirror of Twilight. To stop Ganondorf's fury, to save the land from this evil being, they activated the mirror and pulled Ganondorf into it, sending him away from this plane to a dark but gentle place where Ganondorf would be cut off from his source of power. They sent him to the Twilight Realm. Now we begin a new tale. Long, long ago, before Hyrule was embroiled in bitter civil wars and power struggles, there was a time of peace. After the goddesses created the world and sealed the Triforce away in the Sacred Realm, there was relative calm across the lands. All lived as equals under the light. An evil king would eventually seek out the Triforce, this great power within the mythic sacred realm. Yes, we know this, but he was not alone in this desire. The evil king would eventually meet his demise, beginning the cursed cycle of conflict between power, wisdom, and courage, but others sought the sacred realm as well, some whose names and deeds did not make it into the annals of history. But one such clan we will know as the Interlopers. They were powerful wielders of magic, an enigmatic people who heard tell of the sacred realm, and like so many others of the time, they were intent on finding it and taking it for themselves. These interlopers were so dangerous, though, that the goddesses of Hyrule intervened to stop them. Three light spirits, Farron, Elden, and Lanayru, were ordered to seal away the magic of the interlopers. They contained it within a terrible object called the Fused Shadow. Anyone that touched the Fused Shadow would be changed by its dark power. The Mirror of Twilight was created by the Light Spirits and used to cast the interlopers themselves into the Realm of Twilight after their greatest powers were stripped from them. In this foreign place, they would hold no threat over Hyrule. The interlopers changed. The Twilight Realm was far different from their home, a place perpetually cast in a beautiful, gentle twilight. The interlopers became things befitting the Twilight Realm, 
the Twi'lei, or Twi'li, or Twi'lei, whatever you wish to call them. Though their powers had mostly been taken from them, they were still capable of harnessing some magical abilities. The Twi'lei made this realm their home, and they adapted to it as the years passed on and on. Peaceful they were, quite different from the interlopers of Hyrule that they descended from. The Twi'lei established a home kingdom and a system of rulership. Power structures were created around those who wielded the greatest magical abilities. While it might seem perhaps dangerous to let the most powerful rule, it was quite the opposite with the Twi'lei. Ages passed and peace was maintained in the Twilight Realm. The fused shadow that held the power of the original interlopers was split into four pieces. Three went to the Light Spirits of Hyrule so that they might keep it safe from the world. And the final piece went to the Twi'lei ruler, whoever that might be at any given time. The leaders of the Twi'lei passed their piece of the fused shadow down throughout the ages. War and rebellion were unfamiliar here, as though there was a blessing upon this gentle people. But as these things tend to go, eventually greed and pride did fester in the heart of one who sought power amongst the Twi'lei. One named Zant desired the right to rule after the throne was left vacant. His ambition was to rule over the Twi'lei, to return to the Light Realm, to Hyrule, and to usurp the power his ancestors had lost. Zant believed that he was entitled to rule over both realms, to reunite them as one. While Zant was powerful and a candidate to take the throne, his dark ambition was seen as an unworthy trait of a ruler. Instead, Princess Midna was chosen to take the throne as the new leader of the Twi'lei. And Zant sniveled and raged at this. How could Midna be chosen over him? In a fit of hysterics, Zant fled the castle and threw himself upon the stone to curse his misfortune like a toddler having a tantrum. It was the perfect opportunity for a banished evil to make itself known. Ganondorf appeared before Zant as though he were a god, and he promised the weeping fool that his own power would be housed within him and that their desires would become one in the same. Zant need not kneel to Midna. Through Ganondorf, power would become his. Empowered and emboldened, Zant attacked the soon-to-be ruler of the Twilight. He turned her into a small, impish version of herself. Though he neglected to steal away what was by all rights hers, that fragment of the fused shadow. Midna was enraged by Zant's actions. She knew of the legend passed down by her people, that one day when the Twilight needed saved, it would be delivered by a divine beast. She was unable to stop Zant and Ganondorf, so in her new form, Midna fled to the World of Light, where she could only reside within shadow, unseeable by the beings that walked the realm. There, in the Kingdom of Hyrule, she began to search out the salvation of her people, but back in the Land of Twilight, Zant began to scheme for greater conquest. He hid away the life and light sources of the Twilight world, and the Twilight became mindless creatures called Shadow Beasts, some gentle but most under the control of Zant, an army at his disposal. And then he set his eyes upon Hyrule. It wasn't a slow conquest over the land. He descended upon Hyrule Castle with his Shadow Beasts with such speed and aggression that no defense could be assembled, and he brought with him a cascade of Twilight to cover parts of the lands. Zant and his beasts walked into the throne room, killing all who stood in their way and confronted the ruler of Hyrule, Zelda. She was given the option to yield and live, or fight and doom everyone. And Zelda chose to yield. The alternative was assured mass slaughter. Zelda was imprisoned high within a tower of the castle, and the twilight blanketing the land turned the denizens of Hyrule into spirits who couldn't tell that their world was different now. They were caught in some sort of limbo. They lived in perpetual, almost unspeakable fear of a great evil that they didn't quite understand. Hyrule was conquered. Zant took his place as ruler over a new darkness, and Ganondorf watched and waited from within. Far, far to the south, in a forest called Farron, laid a small village called Orden. Though it was far from the turmoil taking place in Hyrule, the peace of the forest wouldn't last forever. Unbeknownst to the inhabitants, trouble was approaching from the north. But for a little while longer, Orden village and the surrounding lands were quiet. One calm evening, two men sat at the shore of a stream, reflecting on the gentle fall of dusk and the melancholy the hour of twilight can bring. The older of the two, a seasoned fighter named Russell, asks the younger man, a fresh-faced fellow named Link, if he'd consider taking over a special task for him. 
the mayor of Orden Village asked him to deliver a special gift to the Hyrule royal family in the capital city, but perhaps it would be better for Link to do it in his stead. It'd do him good to see the world with his own eyes, leave the forest, experience life, but for now, the hour is late. Russell has a family to see to. A young woman named Ilya collects his horse Epona for a bath before night falls. Then he assists a local rancher in corralling his livestock. It's a quiet and idyllic life. The next morning, some rowdy kids call to him to talk about a new, definitely not a toy weapon in one of their parent shops. He assists Russell's heavily pregnant wife with a cradle. He tries his hand at some fishing, then cuddles a puppy dog. Hard to believe that anything in the world could be amiss on a day like this. The children of Orden Village seem quite fond of Link. Though he's older, he humors and plays with them. Link even goes so far as to buy that new weapon, a slingshot, so that the kids can see it in action and try it out themselves in a safe place. Though one sad-faced boy named Colin, the son of Russell, in fact, clearly feels outcast from his peers. He doesn't quite belong. He's the target of the other kids due to his mild manner. Then a monkey interrupts the fun of the afternoon. Three of the four children give chase to it, Tallow, Mallow, and Beth. There's been an odd energy in the forest, creatures coming out from its depth that don't really belong there. And that monkey is either part of the problem or an ill omen, and the youngins don't want to just let it go. Being the responsible one here, Link chases the kids down one at a time up the forest path, but he couldn't find the boy Tallow. His younger brother Mallow is fine, thank goodness, as is Beth, but deeper into the woods, Tallow's play sword is on the path in a dark cave, and the boy himself is he's nowhere to be seen. Farther up the path is a vendor that gives Link a lantern and access to resources, but the boy, he's nowhere. And to make things worse, there are aggressive bats, plant creatures, and goblin-like beings. And all Link has to defend himself is that slingshot and a wooden sword for practice fighting. But this young man is particularly courageous. Even with the limited means to protect himself, he persists into the depths of the forest. After an expansive search that spans the entirety of the day, he finds Tallow locked in a cage with that same monkey. Both of them seem to be in grave danger and just awaiting rescue. Thankfully, neither of them have been harmed, and Link is able to free them from their imprisonment. Oh, Tallow knows that he's messed up, and that he was about two steps from doom. The monkey had actually tried to protect him. His snap judgment has caused a lot of trouble, and he begs Link not to tell his parents before booking it back towards the village. That man Russell is nearby, though. His son Colin had told him that Tallow vanished into the forest and he wanted to help. He doesn't pry any further into the matter once he sees that things have been made right. There is something wrong with the forest, and he trusts Link's ability to navigate it. Russell reminds him that tomorrow he's to depart for Hyrule to deliver a gift to the royal family, so for now, this business with Tallow is concluded. The next morning is quiet, and the day starts just like any other day. Some chores at the ranch, and then it's time for Link to get ready to leave the forest. The mayor is very supportive of the young man taking Russell's place on this errand, and impresses upon him the importance of being timely and prompt. At Pona, though, she sustained a minor injury on one of her legs, something that Link missed, and something Ilya very aggressively points out. Though, the health of his transportation is vitally important, and nobody wants to see Epona in pain. So, after a great deal of unnecessary yelling, Ilya takes custody of Epona to clean the wound in a nearby stream. Something that Link is going to have to address, as Ilya has no problem interfering with his trip. But on his way there, the children of the village intercept him to demand his wooden sword to play with. It's just kind of one blockade after another today. He's able to get past the kids to the stream to collect Epona from Ilya, but she's decided to close the gate, keeping Link out. She's continuing to yell and refuses to return Epona to him, but Colin manages to sneak his way in and shows Link how to get around the gate. While he crawls his way in, Colin explains to Ilya the events of the day prior and that Link wasn't careless towards Epona, and the injury probably came from getting Tallow back. By the time Link gets inside the pool area, Ilya is ready to concede that she overreacted to everything. Epona belongs with Link. Her leg is all right, they have business to attend to, so Ilya instead wishes them a safe journey ahead and steps aside. But the trouble of Hyrule has reached their forest sanctuary. Under the direction of their new Lord Zant, the King Boblin and his underlings invade the forest pool and attack Ilya, Colin, and Link. All three are taken down quickly. King Boblin is here to find the light spirit that lives in these woods, and he's a highly effective hunter. 
He's found just what Zant was looking for, while Link lays unmoving in the still waters of the pool. The children of Orden Village are collected and kidnapped, their parents unaware of what was taking place as they were all on Link's property or outside the village boundaries. When Link wakes up, the sun is hanging low in the sky and Epona is gone. He remembers enough to know that at least Colin and Ilya are in danger, though. He runs through the forest, looking for signs of them, but just beyond a bridge, he finds something completely alien to him. It's a wall, barring creatures of light from entering. Beyond it is falling twilight. But Link has no idea what he's looking at, and something reaches out and pulls him in. Beings of Hyrule, beings of light, cannot exist in twilight. Their forms will change. Link soon will become a spirit, just like all the other Hylians subjected to it. A shadowy monster holds him in its grasp, choking the young man out. But something in the back of his hand it begins to shine. Destiny has marked this one for courage, and he will rise to greet it. Though not in the same way as those who came before him, the power of the Triforce will save Link from falling to the twilight. It will change him into a divine beast that can freely walk through the shadow. Though he is dragged away, he at least still draws breath. This whole affair is being watched over by another one, however, not far away. Midna spies the birth of the one that she is seeking. Her only desire is to stop Zant and reclaim her throne, and she will do anything to achieve that. This was just the creature that she had been looking for. When Link awakens, he is in a new body and in a completely foreign place. The depths of some dungeon. And he can't get his arm out of his shackles. But she followed him here, Midna. She's been waiting for him to wake up. And at first the creature seems uh, rather menacing. But when she smiles and starts talking, she's menacing and confusing. There are a lot of questions Link must have, and Minna doesn't do a lot to alleviate his confusion. She's rather antagonizing towards him, in fact, and demanding. But he doesn't have any other options right now. She's his only way out of this situation. Minna breaks the chain holding him in place and tells him that when he figures out how to get past the door, well, then she'll help him. Minna recognizes Link as the divine beast from the Twilight Legends. She needs his aid in stopping Zant, but that doesn't mean she's going to beg for his help or spoon-feed him anything. He has to be able to help himself, or there's no point in even continuing. Once Link is out of his cell, Minna strikes up a deal. She'll help him, and in exchange, he does precisely what she says. Given the circumstances, it's less of a deal and more of a demand. For now, at least, it's how things must be. Throughout this complex, Minna and Link come across spirits in the shadows, Hylians who were overtaken by twilight, unaware of what's happened to them. They exist in a state of panic and fear now. Link would be like this too if not for Destiny's Mark, the Triforce of Courage. As they proceed, Minna helps teach Link how to use different abilities in his new body and guides him along a path that eventually turns upwards. This isn't just some prison, there's an entire upper level to explore. The sky becomes visible through the windows and they continue their way higher and higher through the tower. Eventually, it takes them out to an overlook above a castle. This, this is Hyrule Castle in all its melancholic glory. Twilight falls with the rain, and monsters have flooded the rooftops. Midna's target destination is nearby, just across a few buildings, up into another high-rising tower. And at the top of the castle, they find someone that Midna has been colluding with. Princess Zelda. After Zant invaded, Zelda was imprisoned. As one also holding part of the Triforce, she escaped the effects of Twilight. Minna and Zelda convened on actions that they could take to stop Zant. Zelda can't leave this place, so Midna went out into Hyrule to search for answers, eventually finding Link. The two have a familiarity of sorts with one another, a sort of trust already built that has made all of this possible, though as they speak, it becomes apparent that perhaps Midna hasn't told Zelda everything about who she is. Not surprising, as Midna is quite prideful, and talking about Zant's treachery and her overwhelming loss would be quite difficult. Zelda briefly explains to Link what happened when Zant invaded, how quickly the castle fell to them. She chose to surrender rather than doom her people to death through a war with Twilight. She must leave further guidance to Minna. The guards are doing their rounds and Link's existence must be kept a secret as long as possible. If Zant knew that the Divine Beast was alive and taking action against him, he would never cease in his hunt. Minna and Link escape the tower and tauntingly, Minna asks Link if he really wants to go back home to the forest. Because after all, Colin and Ilya were taken. Did he forget about them? Doesn't he want to save them? Well, if he does want to save them, then Midna proclaims she'll happily help. 
She doesn't say it out loud, but tracking down those two would take Link out of the forest, out into the world. It's a very personal motivation that would push him into compliance with Midna's wants. She handles the situation with the grace of a sledgehammer. Midna's next step will be returning Link home. He has some business to see to. The first order from Minna is to obtain a sword and a shield, and he'll do this by borrowing them from a few of the villagers in Orden. A wall of twilight is blocking his way deeper into the forest, and Minna won't aid him farther along the path until he has weapons. Because Link is stuck in this form, he can't just walk into the town and ask for them. A wolf suddenly appearing in town would be quite frightening. The adults of Orden are heartbroken and distraught over the disappearances of Colin and Ilya, and Mallow, Tallow, and Beth. All of the children were taken, and Russell patrols the streets clearly injured from some sort of confrontation. In Link's absence, King Boblin ordered the village be invaded. Only Russell was left as a trained fighter to handle them, but he didn't last long on his own. Now he roams the village roads, beat to hell but still trying to protect the villagers. Link is able to get his sword and shield without terrorizing anyone too badly with his presence. But tensions are extremely high here. He has to track down those children. Who knows what the Boblin will do to them eventually. With sword and shield now in his possession, he's done what Midna ordered him to do, so it's time to leave Orden behind and venture deeper into the woods. But when bypassing that spring, a voice calls to Link, beckoning him back to the waters. But the voice wasn't frightening, nor was it threatening. Once in the pool, twilight beasts descend on him, forcing Link into combat with his new body. It's a little awkward and uncomfortable, but he manages. And once the threat is eliminated, a most wondrous being makes his acquaintance. This is Ordona one of four total light spirits that now inhabit the land. The invasion of Zant has been a terror upon all of them. Ordona's brethren have had their light stolen by the Twilight Beasts. This must be amended. Ordona tells Link of what has befallen the land and how it suffers, and how Twilight threatens all of its inhabitants, even the light spirits. They need his help, they must be restored, or Hyrule will completely fall in time, and then all of the world will be consumed. The other three must be rescued to preserve the safety of this world. His mark of the Triforce and form as a divine beast of legend dictates that only he can accomplish this. Another light spirit is nearby, to the north. The one called Theron calls for help. There too, where his original transformation into a wolf took place, he must find his way back to his true human form. Off with him. There's a land to be saved. Midna pulls Link into the twilight of Farron Woods, and once inside, she taunts him a bit about the whole situation, with the subtlety of a sledgehammer. But he needs her help to get through this, and right now, Midna is the only companion that he has. Twilight beasts are all about the forest. They force the two to work together in taking them all down. A small part of the light spirit Farron still lingers in the woods. When Link approaches, it calls to him. Small creatures of darkness have stolen the light that shields the forest from twilight. Link and Midna must find every piece of it to restore Farron's form and cast away the shadows over this place. Doing so brings Farron back into form, restored in all his glory. The forest once again shines, flooded and beautiful with sunlight. Farron takes his place as protector of these lands, and Link is returned to his true form, clad in the garb of an ancient hero once too chosen by the gods. But Link is not finished here, no, far from it in fact. A darkness rests within the nearby forest temple. It's an ancient dark power, long protected by the Light Spirit. It's a forbidden thing that no creature of the Light may hold, part of the fused shadow. Minna holds one. The other three are within Hyrule, hidden away and protected. Each piece holds part of the power that the vile interlopers once wielded when they tried to overtake the Sacred Realm and claim the Trifers for themselves. But to fight the darkness invading the land, Link must go into the Forest Temple and retrieve this part of the fused shadow. He can exist in both the Light and the Dark he may safely hold the fused shadow. This is precisely what Minna wants as well. Link doesn't know this, and he doesn't know how far she is willing to go to get every piece of it. While Link walks the world of light, she will safely travel with him in his shadow. The two delve farther into the forest, finding it to be sickly and filled with monsters. That monkey that Tyler chased the other day greets them, taking Link's lantern and showing him how to use it to stave off the poisoned fog flooding parts of the forest floor. It's thanks to her that they're even able to get close to the temple. She drops the lantern and bolts once he's reached safety. The forest temple itself is just up the path. Outside is a familiar form, but an unfamiliar being. A golden wolf awaits Link on the path. He approaches it with caution, but intelligent eyes watch his movement. When Link is within range, it pounces at him, though this isn't done with malicious or wild intent. 
Link is taken to another space outside Hyrule, a decrepit warrior before him. This is a hero of the past, an exquisitely skilled swordsman who's brought him here to aid this age's hero. Though he does not disclose from what era he hails, this being once too wore the green garb of the hero chosen by destiny. How he became this is unclear. His only desire is to pass his knowledge on to this Link. Every time the two cross paths, the hero of the past will offer a lesson and strength to Link. Once imparted, their interaction will cease. It's a clean and simple affair. Now, finally within the forest temple, Link finds that same monkey that's popped up a few times already. Once again, it's been captured and put into a cage. It's sort of able to communicate to Link and Midna that it wishes to help them, and acts as a very vocal guide through parts of the temple. It's not just altruism that motivates her, however. The temple is home to her and her kin, family that is in peril. If Link saves them, then they'll help him to reach the end of the temple. It's a fair enough trade. There's some useful gear about the compound, a nipple chicken and a boomerang, things that will be handy in overcoming the challenges ahead. True to his word, Link tracks down and rescues every single monkey in the temple. They'd been imprisoned by maddened creatures that overtook it. Finding and saving them all is immensely time-consuming, but true to their word, once all of them are freed, they join hands and make a monkey rope that Link can use to reach the final room of the temple. Within is a pool made fetid with the poison so prevalent within the forest now, and a creature called the Diababa. It's been empowered and driven mad by the fused shadow. At first, it's two maws above the water. But after a series of attacks to each face, it reveals an even greater form lurking beneath the pool. A monkey that was once hostile within the temple comes to Link's aid with a delivery of explosives for him to use. It was once held hostage by dark creatures that drove it to violence, but now with a clear mind it acts as a helper to Link in stopping what has been destroying its home. Together, they manage to take down this blight on the forest. They kill the Diababa. Left behind within its husk is part of what Minna wanted so badly. Piece of the Fused Shadow. She rather thinks this process has been easy thus far, almost comically so, at least according to her. Minna teleports them back out to that pool, where the restored Light Spirit Farron greets them. Whilst the forest may slowly return to normal, the rest of Hyrule needs attended to. Farron tells Link it's time for him to leave the forest of his own volition. He must go to the east, to the lands protected by the one named Elden. There he will find the ones he seeks, but there too, twilight has fallen. It will not be a simple task. The fields of Hyrule are covered in beasts that attack on sight, and the fall of twilight is apparent even far to the south. Without Epona, Link has to run the roads and fields on foot, so it's one heck of a run Link has to face before he even gets to the proper road leading to the east. Plenty of sword fighting practice to be had, though. The twilight door blocking his way east is somehow more ominous than the one back in Farron, and Midna warns him that once she pulls him in, he may be trapped there for a while. He won't be able to just waltz back out. But there is work to be done, so in they go. And once again, Link takes the form of the Divine Beast, and Midna takes her spot on his back, leaving behind the shadowy state that she had to take in the Light World. Just within the wall, they come across Talos' play sword. Link will be able to track the kid off the scent left on it. He can't be too much farther away. And with him will certainly be the other children. After teleporting a bridge and fighting off Twilight Beasts, they finally make it to a closed-off gate, and just beyond that is a place called Kakariko Village. There's signs of civilization, but the village has seen better days. There are monsters all about the small town. The Light Spirit Elden calls to them early in their exploration and requests of them the same thing as Farron, find and collect all of its tears so that it can be made whole again. The insects that hold the tears are scattered all about the crumbling village and the surrounding hillsides. Within one of the barricaded buildings though, Link and Minda find what Link has been so worried over, the children of the village. They're clinging to a man that Link has never seen, and another one is spying out a window, having a bit of a breakdown over the monsters. But Ilya is nowhere to be seen with the other children. The man panicking near the window isn't of much help for calming the kids down. He's all but proclaiming that soon they'll all be doomed, but the man, the one sitting with the children, is far more soothing and stable, reassuring them that they'll be safe if they just stay indoors. Though the panicking man... He says something most interesting, most distressing. A woman in the village was attacked by a twilight beast, and when they rushed in to help her, she was gone. Instead, there were two twilight beasts. So it's not only the twilight who are being changed into monsters, the Hylians are being changed as well, a fate that all will share in eventually. 
The calm man calls him Barnes, or rather yells at him to make him stop talking. Barnes calls the calm man Renato and asks him if he doesn't have someplace safer that they can hide. Renato says that there is a cellar beneath them, but all the lights in the room have to be lit before it'll open, and there were dangerous insects down there before it got sealed off. It's far too dangerous for them to stay out here much longer, and there's nowhere else that they can flee to. Their best chance at survival is the restoration of Elden, and the clock is ticking for them. Even higher into the mountains, where a people called the Goron dwell, trouble seems to be brewing. They've shut down the path up the mountain to outsiders, there are small, constant eruptions, and monsters are covering the road here as well. Piece by piece, the Light Spirit Elden is gathered up and restored, though, finally banishing Twilight from this place and restoring Link to his proper human form. Elden tells them that the power they seek is atop the mountain in the land of the Gorons, but something has happened there that has draped their land in shadow. Elden tasks Link with going up there and cleansing those grounds. Then they will find what they seek. The children need to be taken back home eventually, but with the state of the mountain and the troubles with the Goron, Renato himself cannot do this, and Link doesn't have the means to safely transport a gaggle of kids across the fields of the kingdom, so for now they need to stay put. But Link needs to find a solution to this problem. The first step will be getting to the top of the mountain to find the next piece of the fused shadow. The problem with that being that the Gorons will outright attack anyone who tries to climb the mountain, and stopping one of them is like stopping a wrecking ball. He just doesn't have the know-how to handle them, and that forces him back down the mountain. But Renato catches him on the path, and he chimes in one more time, saying that he's good friends with the Orden Mayor, Mayor Bo, Ilya's father, and he knows that the old mayor was once able to best the Gorons in some sort of combat, which earned him their friendship and trust. So we should go back and talk to him, see what the mayor has to say, maybe he can help Link out. Hmm, seems that Mayor Bo has a few secrets he's been keeping. It's going to be a long trek back on foot, but there's no other form of transport within the village. But, just before departure, a familiar call echoes down the abandoned street, a horse in distress. Would you believe it? It's a Pona finally resurfacing after all this time, and with a few bulblin on her back, causing her to run in fear. She manages to lose them and gain a link, but it takes some wrangling to get her under control. The whole affair must have been terribly traumatizing for the poor girl. But once she calms and she realizes who her passenger is, the two fall in line to venture together. With Epona at his side, Link can now cover the fields of Hyrule much, much faster. Her arrival was right on time, too. They need to get back to Orden. There's no time to waste. The spirit of the adults and parents back in the village immediately rise with Link's brief return and news that the children were all right. Life has returned to this place, even if they're not quite home yet. It's like everyone can breathe again and the mayor himself agrees to teach Link a few little secrets about handling the Goron. The first is sumo re sumo wrestling? Sumo wrestling. Bo teaches him the basic ins and outs of grappling and throwing much larger creatures than himself, a skill set that really does have some practical use, but Mayor Bo also had an ace in the hole for handling the Goron, a pair of iron boots. Link is a little guy compared to the Goron. He'll need something extra to keep him planted, it helped Mayor Bo in his younger years, and now it will aid Link in his journey. Though Link doesn't yet know where Ilya is, Mayor Bo keeps faith that she is alright, and that Link will find her. Bo has done what he can to help Link along, the rest is up to him. It's time to return to that mountain and wrestle some gore on. Back in Kakariko, before Link manages to return, things seem pretty quiet. The children are in the streets, things are peaceful, nothing is really amiss. Beth and Talo are having a quiet conversation together in the sun, but... Something loud starts to approach. It's the King Boblin, and he's intent on taking a stroll through town and either collecting or trampling something that he lost, a child. Tallow begins to run as soon as he sees the Boblins, but Beth, she freezes. And the King isn't slowing down. Colin, the one so often targeted by the other children for his meekness, runs in to save her, pushing her aside and facing down the King. So, it is he that they will take. Before more victims can be taken and damage done, Link and Epona return to Kakariko. Seeing Colin in the grips spurs him into the chase, but the boldness of this attack by the king makes one wonder, was this planned and targeted to lure the divine beast and opposition to Zant out of the shadows? Is Zant aware of Link's existence and the king is here to find him? Regardless, the reasoning just doesn't matter right now. They ride into the fields of the kingdom and the king calls in backup. But the focus here is the big guy. Link rides after him, taking shots and swings at him as often as possible at high speeds. 
each hit takes a piece of the king's armor off, making him just a little bit more vulnerable. Link's constant smacking drives the King Bulblin off the field towards a bridge. It knows that Link is its equal in combat and a danger. So, jousting is the new game just between them, atop a bridge, and neither may leave. If Link isn't careful, he could knock Colin off the bridge. His goal is the king, not his mount. It takes two massive hits to dethrone him, sending him careening off into the darkness below. And Colin is safe and sound. He can cut the boy down and see him safely return to Kakariko Village. Now himself a hero as well. Awakening back in the village, surrounded by those who care about him, Colin is acknowledged for his bravery. His peers finally acknowledge and appreciate him, and all it took was him nearly dying. Poor kid. But he's proven to himself as well that he does have courage and he does have strength. He need not be controlled by his own fears. He's capable of so much more than he gives himself credit for. While Colin goes to rest, Link must turn his attention back towards the mountain and the Gorons. The same Goron that knocked the wind out of him not so long ago is waiting for him as soon as Link starts to approach, and he starts to roll. This time, though, Link is doubly ready for him. He catches him and tosses him off the path. Now, who is the Sumo Lord? Butthead. The mountain is officially open to his approach. It turns out to be a long, fiery, hostile trek up. Even Midna pops up to remark just how dangerous this place has become. Nearly every Goron on the ascent tries to stop him, and when he reaches the entrance to the mountain itself, a large number of them intercept him along with one of their elders. The younger ones of the tribe are ready to charge at him, but the elder calls for some calm. His name is Gorgoron, and he explains that the leader of their tribe, Darbus, is not present and for some time he has been in charge, though he's hesitant to explain further. So he tells Link that if he can best him in a contest of power, then he'll give him access to the mountain and explain more about the situation. And old Gorkoron is far from a pushover. He is the most powerful Goron that Link has wrestled so far, in fact. It takes a few tries to do it. Admittedly, Link gets stomped a few times. But after he proves that he does have the power to face and defeat the Elder, passage is conceded to him. And equally as important, information. The mountain has been erupting nonstop. The Gorons have a treasure that they protect, given to them by the Light Spirits, which can only mean the fused shadow that Midna seeks. Their leader Darbus and the tribe elders went into the mountain to seek it out when Hyrule's troubles began and twilight began to fall. Darbus touched the fused shadow and he turned into a hideous, violent beast. His rampage through the mines of the mountains made eruptions even worse, so they chained him up and they sealed him away. The other three elders are still someplace in the mountain, each holding a key to where Darbus now rests. Link's arrival must be the work of the spirits, and so they will let him into their sacred mountain. Link must collect the key parts from each of the elders and stop whatever evil has taken hold of Darbus. Well, this place is a hot death trap, isn't it? The mines were kept trapped and as confusing as possible to keep outsiders away, and they did a pretty good job with it. Imagine trying to make your way through a trap-laden, monster-infested hellhole of a mining system while sweating from every pore on your body. That's the sacred mountain of the Gorons. One by one, Link manages to track down each of the three elders and their keys, and of course Nipple Chicken, but each of the elders offers to Link words of support in what he's doing. One of them even advises him on finding a particular weapon stored within the mountain by a hero of old. It's not far ahead. But what he finds isn't a weapon. It's a large Goron wearing armor that attacks him. But this can't possibly be Darbus. Darbus would at least have fangs, right? This Goron is here with good intentions. He wants to protect the mountain and prove his worth. When Link gives him a good slapping, he backs down and gives Link that weapon that the Elder mentioned. And what that turns out to be is a bow and some arrows. The final Elder is just up the path. And with that, Link has all the key pieces that he needs to unlock the door containing Darbus. And within is a most tragic sight. The monster that the Patriarch became is chained to the floor and the ceiling. It looks like it's sleeping, at least until Link approaches. And the crystal upon its head activates, a grand light pouring from it. At first, it just screams at Link and tries to move towards him. Once realization that it's chained sinks in, the creature ignites into flame, superheating his restraints, and he breaks free. Darbus is now a beast called Phyrus. It's so enraged and emits such a powerful AoE that getting close to land sword hits is impossible, and it is hellbent on grabbing onto Link. The only apparent weak spot on Fires is the crystal on its forehead. Link has to get enough space between them to be able to turn and free aim to strike it. Doing so confuses, hurts, and blinds Fires for a short time. But still, Link can't really harm the beast. The chains on its legs can be grabbed, though. 
With the extra weight of the iron boots, he can anchor himself down to pull Firus' feet out from underneath him, so Link can rush into that gem atop its head and deal real damage. It's a process repeated several times over until finally, finally, Firus is felled, and the fate of Darbus is beheld. This could kill the Patriarch. It's possible that he's been dead this whole time. As the form of Firus burns away, Twilight is expelled from his body, coalescing into the second piece of the fused shadow. As the creature before them resumes a more natural form, Minna explains pieces of her story to Link. She hates and rejects Zant. She has disdain for Zelda's life of luxury, though she would never wish harm on her. She just needs the completed fused shadow to set this all right. She opens a way out of the mountain for them, just as Darvis regains control over himself. Now freed from the effects of the fused shadow, Darvis is his old self again. He doesn't really remember how he got here or what happened. He's not terribly responsive to Link's approach. There are other Gorons within the mountain that can see to him. It's time for Midna and Link to get moving. Two pieces collected, one more to go. The restored light spirit Elden guides them to the final spirit in need of aid and the location of the last fused shadow. They must go north, to the lands guarded by Leneru. It can offer no more insight or guidance on that, but really it's all they need. Before they go, Colin asks Link to find Ilya. She's out there somewhere and she needs help. Renato assures Link that with the troubles on the mountain taken care of, relations between the Hylians and the Goron will be restored, adding an extra layer of security to the village. The children will be safe and taken care of while Link is away. He need not worry over them during his travels. So back in the fields of Hyrule it is, now to head north. The final wall of twilight is easy enough to find. It's right where Elden had directed them to go. Once again, Link takes the form of a wolf, and their trek continues on foot, so to speak. Not far past the wall, they come across one of Ilya's belongings, a bag of some sort. So she was brought here, or at least she's been here. Link can learn her scent and track her from that bag. Minna reminds him that the bag could have been there for a very long time. She might not actually be here, so best not to get his hopes too high. The road leads them towards a familiar site, Hyrule Castle. They're right in front of it now. This is a good opportunity to see what's going on inside the city. And the city is still alive, so to speak, with inhabitants of Hyrule going about their business in spirit form, unaware of what's happened to them. There's mention of a water shortage, something happening farther up north that's dried Lake Hylia. The local cats are worked up over the crowds, and a Zora child was found near the city, taken to a bar on the other side of it. Since there's not a whole lot else to do with the way things are, Link and Midna take a stroll to that bar, which is called Telma's Place. It's located down an alleyway, down some stairs, kind of a shady part of town. But inside is a warm atmosphere, and would you believe it, Ilya is here. Though she can't see Link due to the twilight, it's such a relief to know that she's alive and well. She and the bar owner Telma are looking over the small Zora boy, who's completely unresponsive. They've called for the doctor, but he hasn't arrived yet, and the two are sharing in conversation about how this kid could have ended up here so far from home. The soldiers in the back of the room are talking about their next assignment. The citizens of the city have lost contact with the spring spirit of the lake. Presumably, they mean the final light spirit, Leneru. Leneru would be able to tell them more about the next few shadow and possibly why there's such a severe water shortage taking place. So that will be their next stop, turning southwest to Lake Hylia. The lake bed is practically dried out. This is a situation far more dire than those at Hyrule Castle probably realize. The bridge crossing the lake is in severe decline. It doesn't even have legs anymore. When Link and Midna are partway across it, a twilight beast lights a massive pool of oil covering the entirety of the bridge. They were prepared for someone to come this way, but whether they were expecting it to be Link and Midna isn't quite clear. It forces them to jump from the bridge to take their chances landing in the lake and they barely managed to land in water, one of the only pools left. It was extremely dangerous and far from ideal, but they ended up where they needed to be. The Shrine of Leneru is somewhere around the lake. There are Zora out and about, walking in their spirit form within the twilight. They don't know what's causing the drying of the lake and are deeply concerned over why it's happening. Something must have happened upstream at the Zora's domain, but they can't get back there with no river to swim up, and for some reason, they can't even walk back with the way things are. To further complicate the problem, Link and Midna can't reach the Shrine of the Light Spirit. The lake bed being dry means that it's too high to reach, so they need to get to the Zora's domain first. What an absolute pain! It makes sense what those Zora were talking about when they said that they couldn't get back to the Zora's domain on foot. It requires hitching a ride on a giant bird to get through territory infested with hostiles, and once through that gauntlet, it starts to get colder and colder. 
Then they find the ice. The water source of Hyrule has completely frozen over. Another hero of the past once faced this exact predicament. Funny how events repeat themselves. But what is this hero going to do? Because almost the entirety of the Zora people are under the ice, frozen solid in states that make it look as though they were trying to make it to the surface, but they just didn't quite make it. They got caught in a cold snap. Well, it's Midna who chimes in with a thought. Melt the ice, just melt it. Now, where could they get something to do that? Well, they were just recently at a massive erupting volcano, and Midna can act as a teleporter of sorts. So they jet back to Death Mountain, find a massive broiling hot boulder, and Midna plays out some of her useful magic again, teleporting it straight into the heart of the Zora's domain. Hopefully that molten hot rock didn't hit any of the Zora trapped in the ice. It just kind of free falls into it and immediately shatters through. But that was just what they needed because the river starts flowing again, at least for now. There's still the chance that whatever froze the ice could do it again, but in this moment, the water is freely flowing and the spirit forms of the Zora are rising to the surface. There are survivors. They're in pain, choking through the experience, disoriented and feeling sick, but they're alive at least. In time, hopefully they'll be alright. With the water levels returning to normal, they can get back to Lake Hylia and into the Shrine of the Light Spirit. Before the two wade away, something calls to them from within the domain. A tall, graceful creature appears to them, clearly a regal woman of authority. She is Ritella, and she was once the queen of the Zora. When twilight fell over her kingdom and beasts began to attack the domain, she sent her son, Prince Rallus, away to flee the coming onslaught. The prince was to escape to Hyrule Castle to warn Zelda of what was taking place. When eventually the twilight creatures overran their home, the queen was publicly executed in front of her people, and now in death, she feels her son's life fading away. The queen asks Link and Midna to find him, to save him, and in return she will aid them in their journey with something that will allow him to swim endlessly through the deep waters. A worthy request and a fair deal. They know just where that boy is too, at Telma's bar in the city. First though, Link needs to get his human form back, which means putting Lanera back together. The clock is ticking, hero. Back to Lake Hylia they go. The Light Spirit Lanayru is right to the point with Link and Midna, surmising that by now they know the drill, and he's absolutely correct. Find all the tears scattered about by the Twilight insects, fill the vessel, and reform Lanayru. Then banish Twilight from this region. This tear-collecting process is rather arduous and painful. It takes a great deal of time to find all the pieces they need. And the last one is in the custody of a bug that's way larger than the ones before. And ooh, it's gross. It's so gross. A massive pulsating bug thing. All that trouble to squash the pest just for the last tear piece. Lanayru is worth the time, though. With it freed, the sun once again brightly shines over the lake and Link is returned to his true form. Lanayru has a special gift for Link a story. Lanayru tells him the story of creation and of the interlopers that sought the sacred realm for themselves, and he uses the visage of Ilya to demonstrate the betrayal and harm the people of Hyrule inflicted on one another during those intense times of conflict. Even those trusted would turn on each other if it meant getting closer to the fabled power of the Triforce. Even people like Ilya. Even people like Link. It was truly a dark time, and the interlopers were some of the most vile and dangerous. The command of the goddesses to seal it all away, and the actions of the light spirits to steal away the fused shadow from the interlopers, saved Hyrule. And Lanera warns Link, those who do not know the danger of wielding power will, before long, be ruled by it. It was a hard thing to witness, to experience, and to come to terms with. That any can be corrupted by power, and Link is doubly at risk. He holds the power of the Triforce of Courage, and soon within his reach will be the completed fused shadow. What sort of man will he be when omnipotence is within his reach? The next temple is within the lake, a site that he cannot reach yet. Queen Ritella said that she would assist them in traversing the depths, and now that the water supply is restored and twilight banished, Link can safely walk into the city and conduct a proper investigation. He knows where the boy is. It's time to visit Telma's bar. Even though he arrives at night, the city is nice. It's peaceful now. Water freely flows through the fountain, there are no water rationing lines, and it's kind of nice to be around people again. In Telma's bar, a direly unpleasant old man is inspecting the Zora boy, the doctor, apparently, but he huffs off after he exclaims that it's beyond his expertise. 
Like he didn't even try to help the boy. He just leaves like a real grump hole. Ilya finally sees Link here, but she doesn't recognize him. His presence doesn't seem to mean anything to her. She goes back to sitting beside that Zora boy and talks with the bar owner. Talma mentions that she knows a certain shaman in Kakariko Village, Renato, and that he might have the ability to help the boy. Those soldiers in the back of the room volunteered to heroically help them reach the village, but once Talma playfully lays out the dangers of Hyrule Field, they instead flee the bar. Link is clearly a fighter and a traveler, though, so maybe he can escort their cart to Kakariko. Telma is devilishly observant, though. She sends Ilya off to get ready, but immediately confronts that Link knows Ilya. But the girl can't remember anything, not even her own name. She'd found Prince Rallis on the road, and Telma took them both in. That's really all she knows. Right away, the four of them get loaded up and ready for the trip. There's not a lot of time left for the Zora boy, so they really can't afford to wait. To reach the village, they have to cross dangerous territory, and the King Bulblin is back, patrolling a major bridge that they'll need to use. It's another round of jousting that he wants, maybe just a rematch. This time, Link has a bow and arrow, and while he might be changing the rules here against the King, it's all fair in war, right? Link lights him up, brutally landing long-distance shots against him, and once again, sends the King flying off the bridge into the darkness below. But there's still a long ways to go, and the path is littered with smaller bulblins that have their own bows and arrows. And fire. It's a long stretch of road, protecting the wagon, putting out fires, killing combatants along the way, and opening gates blocking their path. They reach the safety of Kakariko Village deep into the night. The wagon made it through the trek. Everyone is safe and sound. Renato is indeed able to take care of Prince Rallis, who constantly asks about his mother once he's settled in. The boy doesn't yet know that his mother was killed by creatures of twilight. And Ilya's memory loss is quite troubling. Both Rallis and Ilya will have a safe place to rest now, surrounded by people who will take care of them and see to their recovery. Telma approaches Link and tells him that she's part of a group that wishes to restore peace to Hyrule. Should Link be interested in such a venture, which he totally is, then he should stop by back at her bar in the city to see them. She would love to have him join her resistance. Once he's alone, the spirit of Queen Rotella appears to Link and guides him away to a safe, quiet place within the graveyard so that they may speak. They convene before the grave of her late husband, the King Zora. It was he that created a special piece of armor for the hero chosen by destiny, someone who would certainly need assistance in swimming and breathing underwater. The queen allows him easy access, and within, Link finds this specialized armor. It will aid him in reaching the depths where the next temple lies, at the bottom of Lake Hylia. Queen Rotella can now join her husband in slumber, and passes one final message on to her beloved child. Be brave. Live on as the king of the Zora, and remember that she loves him. It's a message that will have to wait until later, until the young prince has recovered. In the meantime, Link and Midna venture back to Lake Hylia and descend to the bed of the lake where Zora soldiers stand guarding the entrance to their holy temple. It had to be sealed to contain a darkness that was looming within. Monsters have overrun it. Link blasts his way in, probably to the absolute horror of the Zora guard standing there, and begins his delve into this new, god-awful place. The goddesses of Hyrule have surely blessed Link with a boundless pool of patience and understanding because this temple, much like Death Mountain, is a pure test of both. The very foundation of this place rotates as a giant puzzle. The mechanisms hidden all throughout the many tiers of it require activation before he can backtrack to find more nooks and crannies that lead forward. For hours, days possibly, the two fight and struggle through the Zora Temple, backtracking, unbacktracking, falling off platforms, making weird jumps. I mean, they do find a very cool tool eventually, the claw shot. It does help in speeding up the process of getting around and opening up pathways. But after hours of pain and confusion, finally, Link and Midna make it to the heart of the temple, where the fused shadow should be held. And it's in the custody of something made of tentacles at the bottom of a very deep, water-filled pit. This is Morpheal, and at first it looks like nothing but a giant mouth and party-time tentacles. It's very aggressive and nigh impossible to approach in melee range. 
Link needs to weigh himself down to use the claw shot to pull Morpheal's eye out of its body to inflict damage with his sword, but Morpheal will release bitey bombfish into the arena as defense against this creature attacking it. After several hits to the eyeball, Morpheal has quite enough with the game and pulls the rest of its body out and out and out of the sand revealing a grossly eel-like figure that now swims up through the pit. Link's saving grace here is that it's slow and it's easy to target. It can be pursued through the water if he plans his course carefully. If he can grapple in close, he can repeatedly stab it in the eye over and over. Link chases it down and runs his sword into its skull. Eventually, the blinded and wounded creature has had enough. It swims haphazardly around until it runs its face into a wall and sinks to the floor. Morpheal is dead. Its demise means Link and Midna can finally take the final piece of the fused shadow. This time, though, Midna is apologetic for all that she's put Link through to get here. It was necessary to gain the power they'd need to defeat Zant, but it's time to go now. They have a kingdom to save. Outside the temple, Link has a moment to breathe, but then it's time to move on. Right into Zant. He found them, because of course he would. Their movements across Hyrule have been profound and noisy, and as if Zant wouldn't notice Twilight leaving the capital city. Lanayru tries to defend Link and Minna, but Zant easily crushes the creature, and with the fall of Lanayru, Twilight returns, and Minna can't just hide in Link's shadow here. Zant confines her movement and takes from Minna the pieces of the fused shadow, tossing them aside like trash after Minna accuses him of using old magic to usurp the throne. But in actuality, Zant's power is very different from the interlopers. He comes from an aspect of the Triforce, something that Midna cannot understand. Zant pulls from the twilight a sphere, a conjuring of some sort that's directed towards Midna. In a moment of snap judgment, Link takes a lunge at it, only for Zant to catch him in the air and direct the attack right towards his face. What embeds into him is a shadow crystal, something that will prevent Link from leaving his twilight form as a wolf. This is the perfect chance for Zant to play some little mind games with the Twilight Princess. How unfortunate that she's working with her people's oppressors. How sad that she'll never belong amidst the creatures of light. He needs her power to seal the fate of this harsh, bright world. Her unwillingness to cooperate is unfortunate, so as punishment, Zant restores Lanayru and bathes Midna in its splendorous light before the killing blow can be delivered. Lanayru takes both of them away from this place, out into the fields of Hyrule, away from Zant. So much damage was done to Midna, though, and she's stuck in the world of light now. Lanayru tells Link he must go to the tower, he must return to Princess Zelda, only she can help them. And Midna doesn't have long left.